دایی یه فرصت خوب حالا پشت مدافع خدا داد عزیزی توی دروازه گل گل برای ایران خدا داد عزیزی پاس هم روی زمین گشت سرداراس بود به توی دروازه سرداراس بود گل به نام آسمون و برای ایران بزنه کریم ازداری فرد گل توی هرموزه کریم ازداری فرد درموزه پرتبال باز شد علی دایی صاحب توب توی هرموزه ازداری یه شبا حرکت از کچان نجات پرسه بره کچان نجات توی دروازه گل برای ایران شیش پنج چهار سه دو یک سه دقه تمومه جام جهانی بیس بیس و دو قطر سلام میکنیم به قطر سلام میکنیم به قطر دم بچه ها گرم خوشحالی ما حالی مال ماست ما شایستگی خوشحالی رو داریم خدایا شکرت خدایا شکرت در میان سختی هایی که مردم دارن در میان گرونی هایی که ما داریم Welcome back to another episode of Golbazan My name is Sina and I'm joined by Sina Saimian and Arya Alaverdi How are you doing my friends? We have qualified for the World Cup Yes, we have um, First of all, very happy to be on the podcast to speak about uh, this historic moment uh, in Iranian football history third time in a row we've qualified and um, I'm also really glad to be on with my two friends both of their names are Sina uh, which is a, a bit of a, an anomaly but it's good to have you both yes Sina, you know, great to speak to you and uh, of course Arya as always it's always a pleasure um you mentioned Arya that we both uh, named Sina the uh, awkward thing is both our initials are SS as well so it makes it even more difficult to tell who's who but um no I'm excited <laughs> to be on excited for the World Cup I've Um, as I'm sure you guys have as well, applied for tickets. Um, so yeah, um, very, um, as I said, I, mean, I keep saying exciting, but it is a very exciting time. And I'm sure we'll get into the Iraq game in, in more detail. Yeah, we've all applied for tickets. I think I think Sina has done as well. Sina's had done yeah, this. Yeah, so no, hopefully... I've actually gotten to do it. I need to do it all very right. soon. Well, yeah, hopefully we'll see you guys it. all there anyway. Yeah, yeah, I will do it. Um, but yeah, great to join me by you two. Um, and it, yeah, it's a big occasion and uh, I can't wait to jump into the episode. We'll obviously first be analyzing the Iran-Iraq game, which obviously ended 1-0 to Iran. The goal coming from Mehdi Tarami, uh, the assist coming from Jahan Bash. And yeah, we got qualification to the 2022 World Cup in Qatar with this victory. And as you said, Arya, it's the new record of three qualifications in a row, which is you know a big milestone. But I think A bigger sort of thing that's obviously very monumental is that we had 2,000 female supporters in the stadium, which is, you know, is, is a big deal. Um, so that's, that's also very, very good news, right? And then, uh, yeah, we'll talk about the Iran-UAE game um, a little bit, very, very briefly. Um, so, yeah, I think before we jump in, though, I'd love to ask you guys a question that I know we've talked about a lot on the podcast before, and it's about Skosic and his success until now. 13 wins, one draw, zero losses. And I know we've given some scrutiny on the podcast before. A lot of, a lot of good stuff as well, though, to be fair. Um, and he's also only conceded four goals in that period. What does this, what does this victory mean for him? And how, like, how much credit does he deserve? Tino, I'll let you go first. Sure. So I think, you know, you mentioned something very interesting in there. You ask how, um, what does that mean for him? I think it's interesting to take a look at that. So if we if we put ourselves in his shoes, this is a manager who came in at a time where we've probably been at our, in our lowest position in a, in a very, very long time. And a manager who maybe didn't necessarily have a great, a great support to begin with. And, and you know, I will um, definitely put my hand up and say, yep, I, I was one of them who was sceptical about his appointment. But... You, you have to give him credit. And I'm sure he feels vindicated in the sense that he, he achieved the objectives that he would have had, which was to qualify for the World Cup. And 
at the same time, I don't think he expected it to go as smoothly as he ha- as it has done. Now, we say it has gone smoothly, uh, but I'm sure it's due to a lot of hard work that's been put, uh, put into the team and making sure that the performances and the results have been to the standards that they have. What we also need to take into account is that the way the previous manager left the team was, you know, again, it, it was a shambles, but that was a representation of um, what can happen when you have an extremely, extremely poor manager in charge in the sense that even if you have one of the best squads in, in, on the continent, um, things can still go very wrong. Scottish came in, he's gone back to the basics, he's um, done the simple stuff right. And when you do the simple things right, everything else will fall into place. And that's exactly what's happened. I think the Iraq game was a... Uh, another smooth sailing almost, although the result might have been 1-0, but the performance itself was was good. We've created a lot of chances, but um, I'm, I'm happy for him. I am happy for him because I think, again, he, he faced a lot of criticism and he probably will up to the um, the beginning of the World Cup. But um, I, I think he he's earned his position as the uh, manager of Team Adli. Yeah, I, I agree. Look, um, we speak about identity of the team we speak about what what how the team plays uh what they mean um to the fans how they show themselves on the pitch these things are very important um and you know at the beginning of his uh, of his uh, of, of his term there was a lot of criticism towards him for for that specifically iran weren't really playing a, a, a brand of football that really resonates with a, a, a national team that's ranked what 20th in the world it, it's fair to say that it's not a problem to criticize uh, the manager on his on how the, the team plays i think for sure you can say that yes that has improved it's not uh, it's not great it's not fantastic it's it's pretty good though it's getting to a really good standard and the, the players are responding which we spoke about in previous podcasts are the players going to respond to him the way, not in comparison to Kairos, but are they going to be able to respond to him enough to get us victories? And that's the most important thing. The results come first. So uh, from a results perspective, him, him and his staff deserve the credit that that that, that, the, that they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, and they've give, given us a, a third World Cup qualification. So we have to give them uh, credit for that. Uh, but of course, there's the, the, the question mark of, how much has he been tested realistically by the opponents? You know, is he getting the 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 matches that you know really solidify him as one of the best that uh, Iran's ever had as a coach? Um, he is probably one of the best we've ever had as a coach overall because we've not had that many great coaches, you know, compared to Kairos really. But uh, as a result, you know, of the coronavirus and, and lack of uh, friendlies and not being able to. To really organize friendlies, he's not really been able to get tested. So hopefully, leading up to the World Cup, we are able to uh, prepare ourselves the correct way first of all, but also uh, put in some some good friendly matches against some solid opposition that can really um, make us feel a little bit more certain that when we go to Qatar in November, that we're not just going to go there and just you know just just do enough. We want we want to go there and do better than we did in 2018, which is hard to do because we did really well in 2018. Um, but these um, things have to fall in place uh, before the World Cup for that to happen. I think this is actually important. I think like we should maybe focus on this a little bit before moving on to the Iraq game because we've had we've had a lot of questions that came in, and one of the questions from Kai 2004, he said that Scottish has done very well in these qualifying games. But how do you think he'll do in the World Cup? Because, you know, it's a different sort of a game. It's a different sort of atmosphere. And also you can kind of fuse that in with other questions that have come in from, especially one from Castra 84 This is all from Twitter. That said, um, has our defence actually been tested under Skosic? Um, I think these are relevant questions to ask now, and then we'll jump into the Iraq game. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pre- pretty much what I'm, what I'm trying to allude to there, is the fact that uh, we haven't. I mean, the game we played against Bosnia... If you, if you take your cash your mind back to the Bosnia friendly uh, last year, uh, that game you played a back three was a bit of a, a bit of a you know um, 
experimental lineup with Cover Azai uh, started that game. It's actually one of the only games we've not had Osmond and Tarami playing. And, uh, you know, that game we did really well. It was a really good performance away from home in Sarajevo. Um, that was the only really one that we can look back to and say, yeah, look, that was a really good performance. But we need more of that. Um, we need to get this defence test. Look at it. We'll come, obviously, on, on to the Iraq game. I didn't think, um, for me, uh, uh, Khalid Zadeh had a good game at all. And I think he made a couple of really um, bad mistakes. Uh, Kanoni as well, a few times. He had a good game, but a few times they, they weren't passing the ball back to the goalkeeper when they probably should have done. Should have put more trust in, in Obizade's um, ball playing abilities, which against really, really good opposition with the pressing ability that some of these uh, nations now have and the, and the high intensity leagues that they play in, it could cost us, you know? Yeah, I think it's a really good point. Sina, what do you, what do you reckon? So I think going back to um, the, the, the original questions, I think um, you're absolutely right. You know, the team maybe hasn't been tested to the level that it should when you want to perform and get results at the World Cup. But um, majority of it really depends on what kind of group we get in the, in, in the World Cup as well. Like if we, if we get another group like the one we had in 2018, the work would be very difficult for two reasons. Because firstly, going up against the likes of Spain and Portugal under any circumstances are, um, um, you know, a, a bigger challenge than, than you would expect. Uh, but putting that aside, it, international football doesn't necessarily operate in the same way as club football. You know, in club football, you could possibly, you know, go from playing a, a more possession-based uh, game where you're, committing a lot of men forward one week and then next week put 10 men behind the ball and, and, and play a more of a compact style. That's because you get a whole week or in, in a lot of occasions, two weeks to, to prepare for a game. For these kind of things in international football, that's not possible. You know, you, you can't go from working towards a more attacking football in, you know, over two years. Suddenly, when you get to the World Cup, just expect to play defensive football and expect everyone to know exactly what they're doing. Um, so I am worried a little bit about that in terms of if we do get another difficult group, how will Scottish and staff deal with that side of things? I like the attacking football. I like the fact that we try to get on the ball more. Um, as we said, that the defence is a little bit more exposed um, and against better opposition, we would be punished. Um, but again, that, that all goes to, um, to, to the manager because they will have to accept some kind of risk when, when it comes to playing that style of football. In Asia, as I said, you could get away with it because maybe the, the level of, of opposition, you could give, give them more chances um, than you would probably when you're playing against European teams. Yeah, some very good points. And I think like, yeah, you're definitely right. The, the team overall, especially the defence, hasn't been tested. But if you kind of individually pick out certain parts of the team compared to, say, four years ago, there are certain parts of the team that have improved, like Mehdi Tarami, Sadar Osman, they've definitely improved compared to four years ago. And then there's other sort of parts of the team, like the, the fullbacks, I would say, has definitely improved as well. So I think there are certain areas that have improved, but I think, yeah, the defence is definitely a question mark for me. I think it's a question mark for a lot of our Twitter fans as well, because that, that was a very popular question. Um, but I would love to jump into the Iran-Iraq game. So very quickly, Arya... Were you satisfied with the lineup? I know we did talk about the lineup. Um, we previewed it in the last pod and you were, we were pretty much right, spot on about who was going to start, apart from, I think, the odd COVID case. Yes, uh, look, I think um, it was a bit of a surprise that Tarami got the start, especially the fact that he was, I think he was in the city of Tehran at 4 a.m. Uh, so, like, literally not long before the match itself. Uh, so, you know, it was a bit of a surprise, but he got the start, he's got the goal, so you can't really complain about that. Um, other than that, I wasn't surprised by the lineup. If I'm being honest with you, I think it was pretty much as is with the COVID cases that we uh, didn't discuss in the last podcast, because literally every COVID case happened after we released the podcast. It's absolutely ridiculous, but you know that's our luck. <laughs> so you know, um, I was happy with it as far as I'm concerned. It was really, really, really the only players he could have started in that game. And Sina, what is your what was kind of thoughts on the game as as a whole? Um, I think we started the game a bit slow. Um, it took us a while to find our feet and, and to kind of um, get a little bit more confidence and control over, over the game. But once we got going, I thought we looked 
good. We looked very dangerous and um, very purposeful on the ball. You know, there was the, the, there were times where, yes, you know, there might have been a little bit sideways passing and, and going to the back a little bit too much, but he always ended up with an opportunity or, or, or an attempt at goal. I think we were a little bit fa- uh, wasteful in front of goal, but um, I wouldn't be too concerned about that. You know, this, the, the plays that we have in the final third, you know, we with Taremi, Ozmoun, Jahan Bakhsh, you know, Oli Zadeh, Kodus, of course, and, and um, even on the bench when you have the likes of Karim Ansari Fard or Alo Yosayod Manish, although he might, he might not be in this particular squad, I, I'm not too concerned. But uh, getting the ball to the final third and, and creating those opportunities, it was it was very impressive. I think, they did, as, we, as we said, you know, we, we deserved and the players deserved to score more than one, but the Iraqi keeper was impressive in particular. Um, but in terms of the lineup as well, um, I agree with uh, with Audio. I think it was a surprise, but also um, impressive by Tarimi to to start um, when he just landed in in Tehran. Um, but again, you you rely on those big plays. You know, we have big plays, we have big characters, and and it's in these in these kind of situations where we rely on them to to get us through the line. Um, another big character who's now emerging and getting the opportunities that he deserves is Amir Abed Zadeh. I've specifically in the last 12 months I think he's he's shown that he deserves to wear that number one shirt for the same reasons that Bayron Man's uh, for for the for the reasons that Bayron Man has been struggling at you know going to Europe and 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 um gaining a top spot at at multiple uh, clubs across Europe is is difficult but he's managed it he's worked his way up he's worked hard and there is absolutely no question that he deserves these opportunities and he's showing why he deserves to be the number one. Yes, he may not be as challenged as, as um, uh, you know, to, to kind of show exactly what he can do. But I think getting those opportunities is is an indication, not just for him, because as I said, it's, it's more of a um, more of his efforts coming to fruition. But also, you know, if you have younger players coming through, um, in the in the domestic league, you know, it, it shows that with hard work, although if if you might get knocked down once or twice because he has had that in in his career, um, but with with making correct decisions and and working extremely hard and being dedicated, you can get to um, the positions that that you dream to be. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. He did play very well in in the game. I think the question everyone will be asking now is, does he deserve to continue to be our number one goalkeeper? He's um he's very confident in himself, Abadzada. You know, he, he had a lot of hate uh, going to Ponferradina from fans, uh, which, you know, I can partially understand because obviously, you know, on paper, you're looking at it, you're saying, yeah, okay, Portuguese league, second tier of Spanish football, you know, you're weighing that up. I think personally, they're not that far off each other, uh, if I'm being honest with you. Uh and uh, as far as I'm concerned, I thought the Ponferdina move was very clever because now um, indications are he could have offers from La Liga. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that shows you that not only is he performing on the pitch, but he's, he's very clever off the pitch as well. You know, he's a, he, he brands himself well as a footballer. He's got all these kind of sponsorships with like protein companies and all that, which is great, but also... He, he's able to perform on the pitch and uh, he's making his, his dad proud. We saw uh, after the game, him and his dad celebrating, um, you know, very, very, very beautifully on, on the pitch. And um, I'm super impressed with how he plays, you know, his, um, his ball, as I said, his ball playing ability as a goalkeeper is, is very, very high level. You don't see a lot of keepers that play the ball as well, that, as well as he does, you know, as an AC Milan, if I look at, Mike Mignon, a guy who just moved from uh, um, the French League to, to AC Milan, he's a very good ball-playing goalkeeper, but I think Obed Zadeh, personally, is even better than him, you know, and I think he's showing a lot of, uh, a lot of just clever, um, you know, just, he, he's he's very clever as a keeper, you know, he's able to get himself in correct positions, and uh, I'm impressed, I, I, don't, I think uh, Bayron Van's position is in, is in real, real uh, critical danger. I think like going on to other players that haven't really featured in terms of starting under the you know Skosic era, another one, well, another two that I want to focus on is, is Samogodos and and Nur Afghan. 
they're both players that haven't featured too much, especially someone with, you know, with his talent um, when it comes to starting games. He started this game and overall, I think he played fairly well. But I think, Sina, a question I'd love to ask you is, did he do enough to regain the confidence of, of Scottish? Sorry, Sina, you broke up a little. I didn't catch who, which player you were, you were discussing then. About, about Salman, do you think he did enough to basically... Oh, yeah, Salman is is it's a bit of a difficult one. I feel like he's going through what Jahan Maksh went through on the K Rush in the sense that he he has the ability and he has shown that on on one of the biggest stages in the world. Um, but when it comes to playing the national team, he hasn't lived up to this expectation. He had moments where he you know he does he does show that on the pitch. But again, there are other moments where you question whether he, whether he fits into the system. I think it's a matter of because he's not been used to playing for Iran that regularly. And um, I think through regular kind of time on the pitch and playing with these players, he will um, gain more confidence and he will fit into the system. And I'll be honest, there's not really any um, kind of quality replacements that we could play instead of him um, and I think uh, we just need to be a little bit more patient the ones who play around him are performing, you know, Saeed again even Vahid Amiri uh, the two players on the wings in Holi Zoda and Jahan Bash, impressive and I think when the players around him play better maybe it takes a little bit of pressure off Odus as well in the sense that he can have a little bit more time to find his feet um, but I, I, at the same time, I also don't think competition would be a bad thing for him in the, in the sense that if we have similar players who can play in the position, they should be given opportunities. But at the same time, we shouldn't make Hodus, we shouldn't leave him in the same position that he was on the K Rush, where I think he was a little bit disheartened at times, even at the beginning of Scotch's career, where he wasn't playing. You know, he's a player who's played in, in Ligue 1 in, in France and, of course, in, in the Premier League. Um, so I think we should be patient with, with him and work with him and support him to, to be able to fit into uh, the system that Scottish wants to play. It's, yeah, I mean, it's a good point that you mentioned, especially con- contrasting it to Ayereza Jahanbash, who, who played insanely well this game. He got the assist, he got the man of the match this game also. So do you think like he could get to that level, the same level as, as Ayereza Jahanbash? Godus, um, you know, he missed a big chance in this game uh, and everyone will kind of look at that. They'll say, yeah, he missed a big chance. And that's like, that's all he did in the game. But if you go and watch the game, he actually didn't play badly at all. He had some good moments, great link up play. You know, he's very good at set pieces and he was very effective from them at times as well. Uh, I think Salman, as Sina says, it, it's a case of needing to be, be a little bit more patient um, he has the quality. People are saying he doesn't have the quality. I think are ridiculous. I think he has the quality for sure. You could argue he's maybe not the most hardworking player, you know, and that's just because he's not that kind of player. You know, he's not a Baidam Uri. He's not Ahmad Nurlai. He is a playmaker in the sense that he's going to get on the ball and try and make things happen. He's not going to run up and down the pitch. And actually, he was supposed to play as a, as a right-sided center mid in this game, but he actually ended up playing closer to Taremi at times, like almost like a second striker. So you can tell he's not really comfortable at times in that kind of deeper midfield position. But I feel like he needs to get himself to that level because people are going to um, compare him to Dejarga, a guy who just, just, you know, unbelievable performer for the national team. And he isn't at his level, you know, that's just a fact, but he needs to try and get himself to a, a level where, you know, it's consistent for the national team because Asian opponents compared to Premier League opponents, you know, there's a big gap there. So he, you know, he needs to be performing at this level, in my opinion. Yeah, we, I, the thing is, like I mentioned this last episode, when we talk about Saman and we talk about patience, the guy, the guy's 28 years old. This is like meant to be his kind of prime years. So when you say patience, what, what do you kind of mean by that? What should he be doing? Well, I mean, he hasn't he hasn't played a lot of matches uh, from the start anyway for Iran. I think most of his appearances have been off the bench, or at least you know most of his important ones have been off the bench. And when he has started, he's been taken off quite early. Uh, at times, he was taken off a few times like, at half time as well recently. He needs more time to adjust to the style of play, uh, to the players around him. I think uh, 
he also needs to learn to adjust to, you know, just being in, in Asian football. I think it's a big, he's obviously played in Europe all his life. He's born in, in Sweden. So Asian football is a real, that's why you, you, that's why you see a guy like Ahmad Nurullahi playing really well against some of these like um, West Asian teams. It's because he's played against them so much. He knows the style. He knows what he has to do to get six, to get success in those matches. Someone probably doesn't understand it as well. He's a he's a he's a he's a smart footballer, but when you've played against certain opponents so much, you, it's hard. That muscle memory doesn't always adjust in certain matches. So we just need to be a little bit more patient in terms of now that he's got in the team a little bit more. The more he gets in, the more he'll get better. So, you know, also what, what you need to bear in mind is that football is a game of partnerships. It's a game of combinations in the sense that it's not just but when we talk about combination, it's not just between the two center halves, for example. You know, you look even at Iran uh, the, the, uh, in Team Ali, you look at the understanding and the partnership that Osmond and Toremi have, for example. They haven't necessarily always played together up front. Uh, you know, Toremi has been at wings at times, but because they've spent a lot of time together on the pitch and in training, they understand each other's movements, each other's instincts. And that's more important when you play in midfield in the sense that you have to be able to trust and understand the movement and uh, um, the the kind of style of play of your midfield partners, whether it be Azatullahi, Amiri, Hot Safi or anyone else. And at the same time, you also need to understand the movements of the striker who's playing in front of you to be able to, uh, to perform at the level that you should. So when we talk about patience, it's more that he needs the time on the pitch, as, as Arya said, to adjust to these players. Training is great, but nothing will ever replace a match um, experience and the time you spend with those players around you in a game. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's a great point. That's probably a big reason as well why Baid Amid has become, you know, so consistent when in these games as well. Like I, a question came in on Twitter from Junior. Um, it's not really a question actually, to be fair, but Junior Rodigan, who says, um, would you all agree that Amid has been MVP during the Skosic era? Um, not yes. one week game. And, it's, and it is true. It is true. He's been in, in, insanely consistent. Absolutely. He's been great. Uh, he's And he was great under Kairos as well, you know. It was disappointing him coming on TV and saying what he said about, you know, uh, Kairos criticising him and, and you know, uh, yeah, it was a bit disappointing um, if you go back and listen to it. But I do think he's done really well uh, under Skocic and he's, he's kind of been, uh, he's been everywhere. He's been at left back, he's been in midfield, he's played on the wings. Uh I'm impressed with him. I think he's uh, he's keeping he's keeping himself really fit at, at his age. You know, obviously he started his career a little bit later than most people would. Um, so his you know his his mileage is still a little bit lower, but he's a player who is impressing me all the time. He made a couple of mistakes in this game against Iraq. He actually made a mistake quite early on. I think it was in the first half, and then he, he actually recovered and blocked the shot, which is very impressive. Again, you know but that that mistake shouldn't be happening so let's just be positive with him i think he's done really well and i think um yeah i'm impressed okay so before we go on to the second half performance we'd love to get a fan reaction from erifan who spoke to aria earlier all right i'm joined by erifan uh on twitter at eri1806 a good friend of ours uh thanks again for coming on i'm trying to get you on in the past, hasn't happened. Uh, it's good to have you on finally. Uh, you know, you, you've been covering Iranian football uh, very well on Twitter. Uh, we, you know, we obviously really appreciate all the work that you do. Um, I want to get your thoughts on on the match last night uh, between Iran and Iraq, who, which finished one 0 Can you give us a little bit about of, of the analysis that you that you had for the match? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. I've been uh, following Golbazan for a while, so uh, it's really amazing to finally be on here. And about the game, uh, well, for the beginning, 15 to 20 minutes, we seemed a bit dodgy here and there. We didn't really play too well. But then after that, something hit and we started uh, creating chances and played really well. And I enjoyed how we played. And uh, yeah, we went into halftime looking strong. And uh, early on in the second half, Taremi uh, scored uh, from the Iraqi defender's mistake. And we controlled the game fairly well. 
Uh, should have scored a few more goals, if I'm being honest. But yeah, we controlled the game well. Uh, Iraq had one or two chances, but overall, I'm happy with the display. And yeah, I think it was a good game. And I'm very happy that we qualified. Yeah, and looking at the qualification as a whole, um, you know, under, under Skocic specifically, how do you how do you see the culmination of all these kind of matches uh, leading us to the, now to the World Cup? Well, uh, for the World Cup, I think uh, we should we should have a good preparation up to it. I mean, we've seen how Scottish's team can play. Uh, at times, like at times, they can play really well, but at times they can play really slowly. But most of the times, it's uh, pretty good, decent, and I think uh, the federation should help Scottish and his team. And uh, he should, uh, they should uh, hold some friendlies against uh, maybe some um, mid-ranked European sides or uh, even some African sides. African sides are decent. But yeah, I think Skocic uh, really knows what to do and he's done really well with the team so far. Fantastic. And also, you're, you're obviously you're living in the UAE yourself, so you have a lot more information about the UAE national team as well. Of course, our, our next game is against the UAE on Tuesday. Uh, how do you see that one going in Tehran? Now, UAE, UAE, uh, they have a few players that aren't uh, originally from here. Like, for example, Kayo Canedo. He even scored yesterday versus Syria. And uh, Fabio Lima, Sebastian Tabalik, all these players, they aren't originally Emirati, but they've, um, they've improved the team, to be honest. And UAE right now, they don't have their star striker, Ali Mabhut, and... Uh, to be honest, I don't think it's going to affect them much, even though Mabhut is a great player. Um, like I said, they have Kaya Kaneda, which who is also really good. And uh, overall, their team is decent. And I think they're going to be fighting for that uh, playoff spot, which I think they will get. But um, I see Iran edging the game still, though. Fantastic. And also, I think, obviously, you're an Esther Lal fan. I think uh, Khalil Zadeh is injured, so I believe... Uh, Siabash Yazdani will will start against um, uh, UAE on Tuesday. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, Khalid Zad is actually suspended. He got a uh, yellow card yesterday. And uh, Yazdani will hopefully start. Um, it would be great to see. Obviously, I wanted him to start uh, for a while now. And he's never really got the chance because Kanani and Khalid Zad uh, have been constantly getting these clean sheets and playing decent at the back. But yeah, I really hope Siabash can uh, continue his club form to Iran and show what he can really do and to prove some fans wrong because I've seen many people criticize him for even being calling up, called up. Yeah, absolutely. Erfan, I really appreciate the time uh, and uh, hope to have you back on as well uh, very, very soon. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, again, I'm honored to be on Globazan. Okay, so Tarami's goal in the second half to seal the victory, uh, assisted by Ayreza Jahanbash. Chelleghiyas, <laughs> Agaz, Shudeh Mehdi Tarami, be tu bresid Tarami, tak be tak, khud Tarami, va goal! Goal baraye Iran, Mehdi Tarami, goal mizane, bazi kuri kasa fake demi chanim tu tarki be Iran, huzur dashte bache, shadi hawa daran Irani, tu le varzesh kay azadi. Kadam be kadam, gam be gam, be sud jam jahani darim, nazdik mishi. Arya, what did you make of the goal, firstly? Uh, you know, we got a little bit lucky with the defenders uh, missing the tackle, but it was a good goal. Um, Tarami, um, you know, very positive, good, great first touch out of his feet, you know, attacking the goal and, and it's a good finish, you know, past the goalkeeper. And, and uh, as far that's what Tarami is, you know, he's a he's a fantastic goal scorer. He's a great uh, positional striker and, uh, you know, you give him a chance, he'll put it away. Uh, as Sina mentioned, it's very impressive that he was able to do that you know, having only been awake for like what uh, ten hours before the game, or you know, arriving in the country ten hours before the game, so uh, I'm impressed with him. I think he played he played well. You know, even though he didn't do a lot, he did play well. He missed a big chance in the first half. You know, when he point blank range got saved from the goalkeeper, who by the way, the Iraq keeper had an unbelievable game. Yeah, <laughs> but, can, we, um, can we actually give a shout out to the Iraq yeah, goalkeeper? He was, he was actually outstanding. Unreal. I don't know what his yeah, name is. I wish I knew. Uh, but no, yeah, he was outstanding. Really yeah, sorry, Arya, I didn't. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go on. Oh, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. So, you know, what do you make of Jalen Bash's overall performance and obviously the assist? I think you know we uh, 
Arya mentioned something earlier about Amiri and, and how he's been performing really well on this coach each. I agree with that. I think Jahan Bakhshi is another case where uh, a player has been kind of, his his qualities have been brought out because of the way we're playing and because of uh, the, the tactics and the formation that we use. Jahan Bakhshi is finding himself in a lot of positions that he wouldn't normally when playing for Iran. Um, I, I vividly remember on the, on the uh, K-Rush where he would be really wide at times. He, he would almost be too disconnected from the game and he would find it difficult to either create or score or have any any impact. In the current system, he's a lot more involved. He gets central a lot more and he finds space and he receives the ball in dangerous positions. And that's the thing with Jaumash. Jaumash, one of his abilities is, 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 is making the run and, and receiving the ball in those little pockets of space in and around the box. And he's doing that that a lot more on the Scotchich. He had a, a couple of opportunities in the first half, and as you said, the Iraq goalkeeper had a, a great game. Um, but putting that aside, you know, you want to talk about Jahan Bash as a as a as a footballer and, and just his technical abilities. The pass uh, to to create the goal for uh, for Taremi is an example. Yes, the defender made the mistake, but if you don't put the ball in those spaces, if you don't um, uh, play those kind of um, passes, then, then of course, you know, it, it, it's too easy for the defender. You know, you got to make him uh, kind of almost force him to make mistakes. And that's exactly what he did. And then, um, of course, Taremi with the great finish. I'm, I'm really impressed and I'm really pleased by John Mash as well. You know, he's a, a, a great guy. We've, we've seen him since the 2014 uh, World Cup. And he has an opportunity now to to become one of the, well, the first player alongside Ansari Far to make an appearance for the national team in in uh, three World Cups, if I'm if I'm correct. I don't and think Safi as, well. as well. Hoi Safi as well, of course. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so again, it's it's a great achievement. He's he's uh, one of those big characters and, and a captain. And now he's leading by example, not just as a as a character and as a, as a person but also his performances on the pitch are as I said, setting the standards for the rest of the team he had a really good um, bit of play in the first half as well I know we're speaking about the second half but the first half for the, for the uh, chats for Kone Zade where he just you know he came from behind and just tackled the defender got the ball and played it through it was a fantastic ball I mean it was much better than the one for Tarami as well I mean that was a great ball as well but the ball to Kone Zade was unbelievable and, you know, going back to the goalkeeper, great save. But, you know, Kone Zadeh had a fantastic shot at goal. You know, it's just a pure power. But the keeper saved it. And Jahan Bach, you know, in this game, he showed that, you know, he wants to be the captain. I think he I think he wants to be captain of the national. I think he really enjoys being captain. You know, there was a little part in the game where he goes over to, to Kodus and Kone Zadeh and he gives them, like, a little pep talk before a free kick. <clears throat> now... It was the wrong. Um, he was. He said to them. He told uh, Ali to go and shoot, but he shouldn't have done that. But you know, ultimately, I think he's really enjoying being captain, and I think it's really great for him uh, to have that responsibility on his shoulders. I think that him bringing out his talents and being captain is really good. And I think, yeah, he had a tough time in Brighton, and you know, he has he's had a tough couple of years, you know, because it's not been easy for him, you know, uh, especially with the you know, some of the fans not, you know, criticising him. And we've criticised him a lot of times as well, even recently. Um, but I'm impressed that he's he's turned it around. Feyenoord was a good move for him. Um, and, you know, I just keep it, hope it continues because he's a, he's a player that I really like when he's playing well. You know, in this game, he had a lot of shots on goal. Um, really did well. Hit the post, at, I think, at the first half as well. And if he can keep doing that, um, I think he'll be very good for us in the World Cup. What I loved about about him is that it was like watching him play for AZ Alkmaar, like because he was in that season, in those yeah. kind of two seasons, he was taking risks, he was taking on players, he was shooting from from range, yeah. And these are things that he was doing in this game, and it was such a joy to watch. And that's the Ayres Jahanbash we absolutely love seeing. Um, so yeah, it's it's amazing to see that. And obviously, he won the man of the match as well um, for his performance. Another standout player that you wanted to mention, Arya, was Moharami. 
um, on on the flanks. What did you kind of make yeah. of make of his performance? I thought he was brilliant in this game. You know, um, you know we've sp- we've spoken about the right that position for a long time. Reza Yan, Gafuri, you know, Saleh Ardani, Daniel Esmaili Far. There's a lot of players that have, that are able to play there for the national team. But I think I think Muharami is our best right back, and I think in this game he played really well. You know. <clears throat> I think he was the one who actually passed the ball to Godus for that, you know, that open goal kind of chance. Um, he's he's a guy who, in my opinion, has improved so much uh, at Dinamo Zagreb. He's getting starts now. He's slowly putting the injury problems behind him, and I think he's he's got the full trust of Skocic, a guy who Skocic has pretty much when he came into the national team. Uh, Moharami was one of the first changes he made was I'm going to make him my right back and he's he's stuck with him all the way and I think despite that one mistake against South Korea which would give him because obviously it was Hyung and saw a great goal other than that he's been pretty consistent and I really want people to get behind him because I feel like he deserves it yeah he's a player I absolutely love as well and um, yeah it's it's great to see him play um, guys I'd love to move on to the Iran versus UAE game um, just wrapping up the Iraq game. And I don't want to focus on it too much, but we got a lot of questions about what do we do now, given that we've qualified for the World Cup mathematically. And we've had questions uh, on Twitter. So one from Ash um, and one from Conscious Flesh, at Conscious Flesh on, on Twitter, who both are kind of saying how, given we've qualified now, do we concentrate on finishing first with our strongest lineup or do we treat the next qualification games as an experiment, as, as basically it's like friendlies to experiment with different partnerships, especially in the centre-back region, experiment with different players, different formations. Um, what do you guys kind of think of that? And I think the UAE game is obviously the first game that we can, that we can actually afford to do that. Sina, so, you know, what do you think? I think it's got to be a bit of a mixture because, uh, look, we can't treat every game now as a, as a friendly where it's meaningless. You know, you have Qatar, for example, who go out and and find competitive football for a specific reason. So we can't just now relax and say, yeah, you know, results don't matter. Results always matter, and so do performances. So um, whatever they're doing, whether it, whether they are rotating or not, there needs to be a purpose to it rather than just giving people game time for the sake of it, if that makes sense. I agree that, you know, maybe um, kind of changing the formation uh, to to find out how it works, maybe trying new plays in 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 new positions or, or giving them new instructions and new roles to play could be useful, but not in the sense that you change eleven players, give all of them uh, kind of new positions and new new roles to to play. That that that's not useful at all. You know, we talked about Kodus before, where um, it's through consistency playing in in the main team, in the first team, the first eleven that will bring him up to the, the, the standard that he wants to play at. And that's, that's the same for any other player that comes in. Uh, you know, if you have 11 experimental players, none of them gain anything other than a cap. So it's important to, to stick to, to what he's done up until now. If he wants to experiment, maybe change one or two players to see how they do coming into the main team and playing with the main players. But as I said, if you just play the B team, Honestly, I, I really don't think he would gain anything out of it. And, and putting aside the fact that we've qualified for the World Cup, rotation is inevitable almost. You know, you have two games in space of, what, five or six days. There are bound to be certain changes being made um, through fatigue um, and suspension. Of course, Khalil Zade is suspended. So uh, some of them may be forced, may give them a, a, a new perspective, a fresh perspective over specific players, but some of them may be experimental. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that he, he shouldn't uh, experiment with the entire team, maybe one or two positions. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Sina. <clears throat> a good point, a, a point someone made on, on Twitter was, you know, should we now start Nia's man for Abad the The thing is, you know, if let's just say we even because st- obviously Yazdani will have to come in for Khalid Zadeh first of all, so that's already one player coming in. And if we also change Niaz man for Obadzan, that means we've changed two players in defense, and you know, um, 
they might only play that one game from here till 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 the World Cup in November. So I don't really see how it's any benefit to the team that Niaz man starts in goals. You know, why not just keep always over there? And if you let Yaz and Yaz to play again, he's or he already knows what um, Amir can offer him as a goalkeeper. You know, so I think there's a little bit of logic needed to be in that. Also, what is the objective right now? Uh, they have to sit down and look at the objective. What is it? We've qualified to the World Cup. But we haven't actually secured the first place. And uh, when we're back to the first part of the podcast, speaking about the draw uh, for the World Cup, you know, in, 20, in 2018, we got very, very unlucky, even though we finished in part, in, uh, part three of the World Cup. We still had to, we still got quite, we got unlucky, but, you know, we were, if things went on our way, we would have been in a decent group. This time around, if we can be a wee bit more lucky, we would be great. But if we can finish in part three of the World Cup by finishing first in Group A of the qualifiers, we have a good chance of of at least getting ourselves closer to, to the second round of the World Cup, which is our ultimate objective as the Iranian national team is to qualify for the second round of the World Cup in Qatar. So the best chance we can give ourselves by doing that is by really going all out in this qualifying phase and finish first place. The game against UAE, we have to win it for that to happen because South Korea are not going to lose their next game. And the game the game against South Korea and Seoul is a big game for, for the national team because if we can win this UAE game, go to South Korea, having uh, the current you know two-point difference between the two teams, if we can win that game, we finish first place. You know, so we have to get it. We have to go after this game with a full intention to win it, as far as I'm concerned. Also, um, I before may, I make this point, um, I completely understand that not a lot of people will care about this. Um, or they, as I say, yeah, they just wouldn't care about it. But I think there has to be an element of respect as well. You know, there are other teams in the group who are still fighting for a spot. You know, for example, the third spot, uh, the playoff spot, there is still UAE, Lebanon, and Iraq all still going for it. So we have to show that the, the, level, the level of respect to the other teams competing by continue to play our uh, to, uh, best best players almost you know the best team that we can to go for a win because uh, otherwise as i said it's it, in, in an indirect way it's almost unfair and i understand we have our rivalries with some of these teams which makes it even more uh kind of clear that some people may not care but i think you know when you talk about sport there's there's you almost have a responsibility to make sure that you're always competitive and always going going for the win um regardless of whether for example you, you've qualified for a world cup or not the thing is also COVID nineteen is a big is really is was very prevalent in this camp anyway. You know a lot of players missing. We've had I think six uh, players now gone with uh, COVID. Bayon Van has just got COVID positive uh, today, um, as of recording. And look, uh, yes, for sure there will come a point if that happens, we will have to play players who would normally start. You know, Kamya Binya came on this game which is ridiculous because he was never really anywhere near the national team under Kairos, for example, you know, um, but we had to play him because we wouldn't really have any other players to play that position, you know? So it's just a case of, yeah, we, we have to play players who are going to win the game for us, but also, yeah, I think people are asking a decent question because of COVID that could be a chance for these players to play. So they need, they need a little bit of experience, but I wouldn't say they have to start matches. You know, you can always sub them on. Remember, we can make five five changes now in football. So I'm not too worried about that at all. Let's go to the fan questions that we haven't answered during the actual episode. So, Arya, we missed any fan questions? I, I'm sure that we have, because we got a lot of fan questions this episode. So thank you so much, everyone, for sending those in. From ESCOM. Uh, at O Eskandarzade, he asks, uh, "How should we do with the centre back position before the World Cup? What should we do with it? Should we change players? Should Majid Hosseini come in?" I don't know. It depends on. It does also depend on Poor Ali Ganji if he comes back fit because he he would pose a bit of a not a good problem, but he'd pose a problem because he's obviously a very good player, 
um, yeah. very trustworthy centre back, and he obviously I don't know whether he would fit in. Um, well, to I mean, Scottish's well, plans. Let's speak about Khalid Zadeh a little bit. I think we forgot to speak about him. Khalid Zadeh had had a poor game for sure in this in this Iraq game. Um, and there are question marks as to is he the right person to play at the World Cup? Does he have the quality that we require of a defender against top, top t- uh, European sides, for example? I'm not sure he does. Pirelli Ganji, for me, is our best centre-back when he is fit. And obviously, a bit of news on him. He is back training now. Uh, he will be, I think, part of the next camp for sure. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, look, Majid is doing well in Turkey. Uh, Kanoni is doing very well uh, in Qatar and for the national team. We have good centre-backs. Yazdani is doing well for SL1 as well, of course. But uh, I think we have to find consistency. And if if from now until the World Cup, Khalid Zadeh and Kanoni are still starting together, I think they should start at the World Cup, you know, just for the continuity factor. I I agree. Um, I think Khalid Zadeh, I've always compared him to Eric Bailly at Manchester United in the sense that he he's a good defender and he has the right skills and and uh, the necessary tools to be a good defender. He just you just know that there is something in him that will cause him to to make a very um, significant mistake, one that will be game changing. And he always has that in his locker, which is always a worry. You know, you, you never won that sort of a play in the defence. I think the way we play also doesn't necessarily help our defenders. I think one of the things with K-Rush and why our centre-backs would always stand out is that they would always have the necessary support from full-backs and midfield. I think Purelli Ganji, we forget that he was actually a defensive slash central midfielder before he was made into a centre-back by, by K-Rush. Um, and, and he performed comfortably because he had the support around him. That support will need to be provided when we go into World Cup. He's better a position, regardless of whether it's a combination of Khalil Zadeh and Kanani or Hosseini and Puradi Ganji or any mixture of the four. I agree with Arya that you know if if we can if if we can play Majid Hosseini, for example, or, or Puradi Ganji instead of Khalil Zadeh, then it should be done. But if we go into the World Cup having played uh, Khalil Zadeh and Kanani, then suddenly to change it going into the into such a big tournament is is a little bit amateur for me yeah agreed so yeah that's good good that we talked about that have you got any other questions Arya, from from the fans I had a question from uh, at Ari Arion uh, he asks uh, Nur Afghan is talented had a decent game yesterday but when Milad Mohammadi is fit should we start him instead I think Milad Mohammadi has as I said on the, on the previous podcast he's gone through a difficult spell in his career I think he's um He's a very good left back. He's not a bad player. It's just I think he's gone through a difficult spell and he's not able to kind of perform to the heights that he, he once did in Russia. And I think he's kind of frustrated about that a little bit. It's not. It's not maybe. It's maybe it's playing in his mind a little bit too much and it's it's bringing down his performances. I think for Iran, he hasn't been bad, but he hasn't been particularly good either compared to what he used to be. You know. So I think. And I think Nur Afghan has done really well. I think he has done really well. I think he's very confident. I think, in contrast, he is in the right mental state. You know, he's doing very well in the in the PGPL for Sepahan. Um, I think he's found himself at left back, Nur Afghan. I think if he keeps doing well, he should start. He shouldn't just get dropped because Milad is playing in Europe, for example. No. If he's doing well, he should start. But Milad Mahamadi is a good player and we know he has a lot of ability, a lot of pace. He's a good defender overall so if as same with the last question if he can start then yeah potentially I'd, I'd want to see him start but if Nur Afghan is starting he should start you know what I mean he's he's improving every game every time I watch him play every time he's got a new game he's he's getting better and better Nur Afghan so the, the trajectory that he's going on I I would like to see him start but I mean there's a lot of time between now and you know uh, the World Cup Nur Afghan when he first burst onto the scene at SL1 and he was playing regularly, I said then that he, uh, this guy is a replacement for Hosh Safi in the long term. And that's exactly what he's becoming. And uh, mark my word, my word, there will be a time when Amiri retires and this guy will be playing central midfield instead of Amiri. He's a player who will be in the squad consistently 
even if he doesn't play, because he's a great utility player. He can play multiple positions. I agree with Arya in the sense that if he's look, don't fix something that isn't necessarily broken. You know, if 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 he's playing well, if he's got uh, a good partnership going with the players, if he understands the game and he's uh, doing what he's being told, there is no necessity to change him. Similar to what I said about Kodus as well, if there is competition, it's always great. Mohammadi, when he's fit, when he's playing uh, regularly, he will bring good, healthy competition for that left back spot, and then they can again fight it out amongst themselves. There's no harm in having two quality fullbacks and and having the choice as to which one to play. Um, but Nur Afghan, for me, will be in the squad regardless. He will be in the World Cup. Uh, he will probably play one or two games. But as I said, he's a he's a utility player, and and every team needs one or two, one or two players like him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last question before we finish is uh, from at SN007007. He asks, um, so he's, got, he's got two questions. We've already answered his first question a little bit. The second question is, uh, preparation for the World Cup, are we going to get any meaningful friendlies um, from top countries? I, I, like this. There's no way of knowing that, is there? I mean, we're not really the right guys to ask the question, but I would hope so. <laughs> If he if he has the contact details of the um, president of the FA, that might be a good person to call, and think, uh, um, yeah, give him recommendations. It has to happen. It has to happen because uh, uh, this national team it deserves a preparation. We had a decent preparation from not from maybe being a little bit too too nice to the federation. A decent one for the twenty eighteen World Cup. We were able to get the players in for the. The um the weekend monitoring at the the Peck Center in Tehran, you know, they used to come over and do some like um, uh, you know, recovery training. That was good, but we need more. I think if this national team could prepare properly for the World Cup, you know, we saw it with the the women's national team how how poorly they prepared for the women's Asian Cup. Um, they lost really badly in the in their last two games. If Iran can, that's just a, a that's a very really, very extreme example, you know, with no preparation, a team has never been to the competition. But when Iran has the experience of 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 two World Cups in a row now, of um, you know doing good in the Asian Cups up to a standard, and then obviously falling off in the semi final. But with the experienced European based players that we have as well, if we can prepare the right way and get ourselves ready for a big competition, and uh, we play as he asks, with, with good teams, you know, high-quality high, high quality opponents, then I don't see why Iran can't really compete for a second place or, or hope, you know, that's a bit too optimistic, but maybe even a first place <laughs> in the World Cup, you know? Uh, so let, let's see what happens, you know, well, but hopefully. I know, I know we're short for time, so I'll make this point really quick. Um, the preparation for the World Cups, we need to bear in mind that it will be completely different and awkward when comparing to previous tournaments. Yeah, of course. Um, I think at best, um, Scottish might have his players a week, maybe 10 days if he's lucky, uh, before the tournament. Uh, so they will, there will be a lack of preparation going into the World Cup. So if he wants to prepare, the preparation will have to have begun already. If there are meant to be good quality friendlies, they need to happen at some point in the summer because in the lead up to the World Cup, as I said, it's, I find it very, very unlikely that he will have the 23 players that he's chosen uh, more than a week or, or, as I said, 10 days at best before the tournament starts. And and, and again, that puts the smaller teams into a, a more of a, a disadvantage. But again, we, we it's not something that we can have a say over. And with COVID on, on the rise, you know, you saw this camp, so many players missing. Of course, if we lose players and, and the team overall isn't prepared, then we could be in trouble. So we have to get it to an early preparation for sure. Yes, wonderful point. Um, so that's it for the fan questions. Thank you again so much for sending those in. Um, and if we didn't read any of your fan questions, don't be deterred by that. Send them, send them in the future. Um, and don't forget, we'll have an article before the game against UAE on our website. Uh, and also we'll do a live Twitter spaces before and after the kickoff, which is on Tuesday. Um, so thank you so much for listening to this episode of Gold Bazan. Stay tuned and follow us on all social media platforms and podcast platforms. Um, I've been Sina Sadzada, joined by Sina Taimian, um, Ali, Aria Oliver. Oh,
mate, what is wrong with me? All right, just, just start again, right? Go. Sina Saimian and Aria Alaverdi. Sina Saimian and Aria Alaverdi. Um, thank you so much, guys, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Saman Godus. I'm playing for the Iranian national team and Brentford Football Club. And you are listening to Golbezan podcast.